Welcome a, a panel of distinguished speakers for this opening round table. Um, as you know, our conference is about the future of work and immigration, and of course, in relation to the pandemic. Um, I want to say that we had started thinking about this topic already before uh, the pandemic hit us real hard nearly a year ago. But um, as the pandemic went on, it became clear that it wasn't going away within a month or two. Uh, we thought that this remained a very important issue. How is the future of work? How is work changing? How are workplaces changing? And how is this related to immigration and migration for Canada and more internationally um, in relation to essential work and to essential workers um, and to entrepreneurship, to our migration governance regimes and all, this, all these issues that we'll be discussing in the coming days in our other panels. However, this opening round, round table is really more devoted to Canada. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have uh, the following distinguished speakers. First of all, the president of Ryerson University, Mohamed Lakshemi. I'm very pleased to have him with us who will tell us a few things about how the pandemic has affected universities too. Um, and then in, uh, I'm presenting them in the sequence in which they're gonna speak, Doug Porter, who is a chief economist from BMO. And I hear, Doug, you and your team are very successful in economic forecasts. You have won several awards. So I look forward to hearing your, your views on the pandemic recovery and immigration. Then a distinguished entrepreneur of immigrant background, Mohamed Faki, owner and founder of Paramount Foods. I'm delighted to have you with us. Um, I've always liked Paramount Foods, but I think there's so many important things to be said about how the restaurant industry has been affected but this prolonged lockdowns um, that we've all experienced. Zabin Hirti, who is now uh, executive advisor to Deloitte on the future of work, precisely what is this conference about, but has a long experience, not only as chief human resources officer at RBC, but also as one of the people that uh, participated in the inception and foundation of TRIAC. Uh, for those who, who don't know, TRIAC is the Toronto um, Immigrant Employment Council and really facilitates the contacts between employers and newcomers. And last but not least, Jean-Christophe Dumont, who joins us all the way from Paris, uh, who is the head of the International Migration Division at the OECD, um, and a long-term colleague, I have to say, who will give us a little bit the international perspective uh, in relation specifically to Canada. So it's going to be an exciting, exciting discussion. As you know, we like to be very participatory. So we encourage all the participants to keep their cameras on if they wish. Um, you can write your, uh, your comments and questions in the chat. I we will start with very short introductions uh, in response to my questions from the main panelists. And then we'll open to questions from the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Mohamed Lakshemi. Um, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, welcome to the um, conference on, on migration and the future of work. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Um, Anna uh, Chidan Fedou, uh, for and her team at Ryerson for organizing this uh, great international gathering. Uh, I would like also to extend my um, thanks to the panelists for joining us to discuss this uh, increasingly important topic. Um, and it's a topic that is very important uh, for me personally. Uh, I'm the president of a university that is located in uh, Canada's most uh, multicultural city. And we uh, proudly uh, talk about wanting our university to be uh, as diverse as the city we call home, Toronto. Uh, I'm also um, an immigrant and uh, one time international student. I, uh, began my journey over 34 years ago uh, when I arrived in Sherbrooke, Quebec to uh, pursue my uh, master's degree and eventually my uh, uh, doctorate studies. Um, uh, I know the challenges I faced uh, those many, uh, many, many years ago, and I am well aware of the challenges international students are facing uh, today. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting with the uh, ambassador of Canada to China. Uh, he spoke with uh, a number of university leaders about the concerns of Chinese families who want to 
uh, want their uh, children educated abroad and the challenges of making that a reality. For example, here in Canada, we are uh, seeing extreme delays in uh, how long it is uh, taking the federal government to issue uh, student visas. In uh, some instances, it's taking up to, uh, I would say, seven months. Uh, it's uh, about four to six weeks in other countries, in particular in the UK these days. Uh, and it's not just the uh, students and their families who are affected. Um, I can tell you over the uh, uh, fall uh, semester here, I met with nearly 300 faculty members in our university. And it was interesting to me how many first year professors were unable to migrate uh, to Canada I met with I met with faculty who are working at Ryerson while still continuing to live in Georgia, in New York, and elsewhere around the world. Um, as much as we uh, talk about the importance of um, immigration and increasingly uh, globalized world, uh, I also think we need to do a much better job at understanding it. Uh, our Canada Excellence Research Chair, Migration program is helping to do that. Um, building an academic community centered at Ryerson, uh, but engage with immigration scholars from around the world. Um, and uh, in, in its first year and their excellent uh, leadership from my colleague Anna, the program has delivered, uh, bringing together students, scholars, uh, policy makers, and industry leaders to address the many issues of migration. And now, as we uh, endure a global pandemic, that mission takes on a new significance. Uh, we are determined to do all we can to assist in the global uh, economic recovery from COVID-19 uh, to succeed. Uh, I think that's the pro probably the most important thing for the recovery process, to succeed the talent of all our citizens, especially immigrants. Uh, we need uh, to integrate that talent piece in the recovery process. Uh, we need to ensure that newcomers are supported and that they, are, they have full opportunity to participate in the labor market of the future. I can tell you uh, too often in Canada, when we come face to face with the reality of uh, reality for immigrants, um, and I give you an example here. I always face this reality when uh, uh, I step inside the taxi. I find it disturbing uh, when I talk to the driver and find out that they have foreign credentials as medical doctors, uh, PhDs in nuclear engineering, and the best job they can find is to drive the taxi. Uh, no dis dis disrespect to those who do that difficult job, but rather than have the best educated taxi drivers in the world, we need to find a way to give immigrants the opportunity to participate fully in our labor market, especially in post pandemic war. Here at Ryerson, we have launched a program to help internationally trained medical professionals transition uh, into non licensed medical careers in Canada. Graduates of the program have been actually hired to help with our province response to COVID. There is, we know that there's a gap uh, in terms of finding uh, professionals in healthcare. And I would say this is a small step, but one that is in the right direction. So for um, everyone's sake, we need uh, to make sure that countries, communities, and immigrants find their way in a changing world. I know you will be exploring this and more this afternoon, and I wish uh, you all the best for a wonderful conference. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Yeah, I, I should then, and thank you for all your kind words about our program. Um, uh, I cannot overemphasize how Ryerson is a well, uh, you know, welcoming and collegial environment and how much I'm uh, enjoying my time here and uh, as I was saying earlier to the panelists and I think some of the participants in this conference know I'm also relatively new to Canada nearly two years now uh, of which one a pandemic year 
I think you raised uh, quite a few of the important issues, both the dynamism and, and importance of immigration, particularly of international students that are, of course, at the core of our work at universities, but also the problem that we will be discussing of how to make the, best, the most of um, migrant skills, um, when particularly when they're selected through the point system, so on the basis of these skills, but also how the pandemic has been a magnifying less of some of the contradictions of the system that we will touch upon also today. I'd like to give the floor to Doug, um, and Doug, my question to you is, what does the future hold for Canada as we go, as we leave the pandemic behind us in terms of the economic recovery, and how do you see immigration playing a role in this recovery? Okay, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and first of all, thank you to Ryerson to, for inviting me to uh, join this August panel. Uh, on this uh, very important topic. Um, so on, on the, the big picture for the economy, I, th I think there are two stages here. First of all, there's the initial recovery from the pandemic, which is still ongoing, of course. And, and I don't believe we're gonna have a full economic recovery until we've completely put the, uh, the health crisis in the rear view mirror. And frankly, as an economist, I can't tell you exactly when that day will be, uh, but we're assuming it will probably will be close to full recovery in, in 2022. Um, we, we still do believe we're going to have quite a firm economic recovery this year, but it will be partial. I think many of you have probably heard of the, uh, you know, the much talked about K-shaped recovery. I think that actually does apply to sectors probably better than anything else. There are clearly some sectors of the economy that uh, while they were hit last spring have, you know, in, in some cases, not just recovered, have more than recovered. And the classic example there is the housing market in, in general, which is now actually stronger than it was before the pandemic began. There are actually some commodity markets, uh, some commodity industries that are now stronger than they were before the pandemic began. But of course you have the other side of the K, uh, all those industries that are directly or even somewhat indirectly affected by the pandemic that are nowhere close to being recovered and you know, are operating in some cases 40, 50 or even 70 or 80% below pre-pandemic levels. And as I said, until we put the health crisis behind us, those sectors will, will not fully recover. Um, we're also probably going to have a somewhat uh, uneven recovery between, you know, what economists love to talk about GDP and overall spending and actual employment. Employment probably will be slower to recover than the headline GDP numbers. I mean, when people talk about these terrific GDP numbers, they don't necessarily immediately translate into a, a solid jobs recovery. And for instance, in January, uh, the latest months we have, month we have available, the unemployment rate was still above 9% in the month of January. Just to put that in perspective, before this all began, Canada's unemployment rate was hovering in the 5.5% range. Um, we were still about 800,000 jobs below where we were before the, the pandemic began. And we think even by the end of this year into early 22, uh, the unemployment rate will, will still be a long way uh, from getting back to those pre-pandemic levels. When you think about the sectors that were hit, especially hard, um, they are very jobs rich. Thing, and you know, we're gonna hear a lot about the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry in general, the, the travel industry, those are very jobs rich sectors. And while we do believe eventually they will recover and they might look a little bit different when we have fully recovered, um, it's, it's going to be a, a prolonged process, we think, before they're back to full health. Now, turning directly to the topic du jour, the topic at hand is, uh, you know, how does immigration play into all this? Of course, before this all began, a key feature of Canada's economy was we were seeing some of the strongest population growth that we had seen in decades. For instance, in 2019, Canada's population grew by a little bit more than one and a half percent. In raw numbers, it was actually one of the largest uh, increases that we have ever seen in Canada's population in, in 2019 of over 500,000 people. Of course, that turned on a dime as a result of the pandemic. We saw immigration numbers uh, drop by roughly 50% last year. We actually ended up having the lowest, not surprisingly, the lowest number of uh, immigration that we've, uh, that we've seen in, uh, in more than two decades. Uh, so a very important driver of the Canadian economy, understandably so, was turned off like a light switch in, uh, in, in 2020. Uh, the federal government, as is well known, is, uh, is now looking to uh, play catch up in the, in the years ahead and has actually increased uh, the immigration uh, targets in, in the years ahead. Uh, again, I think the pandemic is going to play a very big role in terms of you know, how, how quickly we can actually get back to, the, to, to some of those numbers over the medium term. Uh, but I do think in the, in the post-pandemic era, yes, 
uh, naturally, we I do believe we'll return to uh, maybe even stronger population growth rates ultimately than what we were seeing beforehand. Uh, this plays a key role in the uh, you know the medium term outlook from a, from a number of fronts. Of course, the government is a big believer uh, that this is uh, you know this is a pro growth uh, policy. You know whether it's through business formation or even uh, helping support demand, uh, helping support the uh, the housing market. It uh, it will play a, a vital role and and also. You know, in innovation as as well. Uh, the, it's a key driver on on that front. Uh, we do think it will play an important role in uh, in Canada's medium term recovery. But frankly, you know, over the short term, the biggest driver is is the health uh, situation. You know, and just to put it, you know, to put it into into perspective, in the in the months of March and April, the Canadian economy contracted by more than eighteen percent. Um, you know, in, in a typical year, as I said, immigration is roughly around 1% of the economy. So, you know, of course, immigration is, is vital to, to the medium term outlook. But this is, this is an event like we've never seen before, or at least not, uh, not in our, any of our lifetimes. Um, you know, we, we just had the biggest global contraction in, in the global economy in the post-war era. And uh, we, we are firm believers that we will see a, a relatively robust recovery over the next year, but that is gonna dominate, frankly, uh, the near-term outlook. The medium term, yes, immigration is very, very important, but the, uh, the short-term outlook is completely uh, dominated by, uh, by the health crisis. Um, I see I've actually just about run up against my time, so I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, point now. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Doug. Yeah, of course, it's encouraging to hear that uh, we, we seem to be getting towards easier times, and and uh, but but the recovery will take as long as uh, I mean, will get us uh, into 2022 before we see the full uh, you know the full recovery coming up. But I think that there is a sector like the restaurant sector uh, that cannot just wait until 2022, and and that um, and I would like to ask. Mohamed Faki, what what, uh, what does um, the look from the restaurant sector is in relation to the recovery, and particularly again with regard to immigrants? Um, we know that the restaurant sector has a lot of people of immigrant background as entrepreneurs and very successful ones. At the same time, a lot of newcomers are employed in the sector as employees. So, what is your view, uh, Mohamed? Sorry, turn on your microphone. Maybe you don't want to hear me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you very much to Ryerson and uh, for organizing this and to all the other panelists. But yes, definitely. Uh, the restaurant industry is one of the most devastated uh, because of this pandemic. But I'm not planning to depress you all today. I'm actually planning to want you to see some of the very beautiful things and positive things that I am seeing. Right, those early early days in, in March, we woke up one day where our sales were several million dollars a month and it went down to zero. And we didn't know how long it's gonna take us to come back. If we were ever coming back, uh, first we thought it was a very short term. So we did the right thing, which is paying our staff while they're sitting at home, we have to do that. And as soon as we start opening, we actually dropped our prices because we knew Canadian wanted their dollar to buy them much more. So we wanted to actually go on the side of the community and say, profit aside, let's put people first, which is the culture and the DNA of Paramount, what we've shown so far to the entire city and our country. But that's great. But that said, there was several million dollars every month dripping burn because we had to do something about it and it was taking longer and longer. So definitely we had to evolve. And for people like myself, 75 locations around the world, every region <laughs> had different restrictions, different circumstances, and we had to evolve in different places differently. But looking even at a single restaurant, right? They were losing money every day. So they had to survive from debts and borrowing, and they continue doing that. I argue today that 90% of small businesses are surviving from borrowing more money. So it's gonna get to a point, unless the government step in, steps in, and or dogs steps in, I'm just kidding, or banks do more, right? But we don't wanna borrow more. We don't want those small businesses to borrow more. So it's devastating, but that's what I saw as well. Let me tell you what I saw. I saw great people that committed to do good things for our country. I saw a very important test to our culture as Paramount when everyone came in and that speak very, like speaks volume for the power of immigrants. 
and the power of immigration and how important it is to mix the experiences that immigrants bring in. An experience that I brought in basically when my team walked into the room and said, let's cut down, let's put back the staff at home, let's shut down location. I said, no, that's not what we're doing. We're gonna run forward and we're gonna use those restaurants and bring in new brands. That's what I learned during the war in Lebanon. You know, you don't wait for the circumstances to get fixed because it might take years like we all saw in Lebanon, it's been 50 years. You change and you adapt and you evolve. And there was a conversation here, three quarter of my team, they're born in Canada. They're, you know, my second person in command is named Carolyn White and the Jay is here, runs the operation. And all of them said, you're crazy. What are you doing? And no, the crazy was the answer. The survival and persistent of an immigrant that's hungry to prove themselves is what we need mixed today with the mentality of we're tired of the pandemic and I don't know how the health doctors are gonna resolve it. And we don't know this and we don't know that. No, I'm so proud of the PML culture that actually came through and succeeded the test where we put people, purpose, and planet first. And we saw that the profits start coming. So what we did, we actually launched four brands. We went into Raba supermarket as well to put Paramount there. And actually the profit came. And what we did, lowered our prices to help the community, set the kitchens and to every restaurateur out there, even if you're struggling today, you have a lot of food in your fridges and you're hot. a lot of beautiful staff sitting, waiting for a job. Donate some of that food. Help the community. There is nothing better than showing that during the worst time that we come together as a community. And that's the only way. Our solution today is immigrant and people who's been here for very long, mixing together, working together and save our country. We need that hungerness that I came with. I came very hungry to prove myself. And while I'm proving myself, I help building this country better. And not to make it better. I'm very small to make this country better. This is the most beautiful country on earth. Has the best people that I love so much. They've made me who I am from a poor person to who I am today. But I brought here as well the hunger of Terry and Caroline and telling you, Jay, and telling my team, no, our, we're not going on our knees. There is a country for us to save. Let's build it again. Let's build more businesses and hire new people. And that's what the immigrant mixed with their expertise, bringing it here, bringing that expertise while we give them the opportunity. I worked for free while I was working at Tim Horton to prove myself that I'm a good gemologist. You know, gems don't speak English. Gems are gems. And <laughs> certifying a gems and being a gemologist should be the same across the world. I had to work for free, right? So we need to give them that opportunity. We need to give them equal opportunity. And we need to have our boardrooms and our government offices look like our streets because we need that positivity those immigrants bring and those refugees. I'm an immigrant. I'm a refugee. I cried when I put my sign on the Hershey Center, seeing Paramount Pine Food Center, the same city where I landed with $1,300 of my pocket. I'm a live example when Canadians with their generosity gives an opportunity to someone just arrived here. We will employ people and we will always employ people because to me, there is no dollar worth having unless you share it with someone else. And there is no business that makes me happy unless I employ people in it. And that's the immigrant mentality. And that's why we need more immigrants. We need more refugees and we need them mixed with our Canadian. They actually bring so much positivity. When we brought the Syrian refugee, our team member had a story to tell to their family member on their dining table when they were helping them. And now they work very closely and together. Well, Mohammed, thank you very much. This is what we need to hear, truly. Uh, yeah, the story of resilience uh, that, that you're saying and the story of positivity. And I think if one thing, I, I wanna hope that if one thing we have learned from the pandemic is also that we're all vulnerable, that things can turn wrong. And in, in countries where things seem to be very certain and secure and very predictable, like in Canada, and I think there is a lesson to be learned, both in terms of our vulnerability, but also in what you said about resilience and solidarity and working together. I very much want to hope that the, um, 
as you said, we can now look to, towards a brighter future, particularly for, for the smaller businesses. I realize, and I've followed also your uh, writings in the newspapers in the last months about you know, the, the difficulties of the sector and the differences between being a, a larger or a smaller enterprise, and as you said, living off borrowed money. But I want to turn to Zabine who, well, has so many decades of experience at the RBC, but I think she's here with her different hat. I have to say that in our previous meeting in preparing the conference, Zabine said she's, she's retired from her main job. And I said, Zabine, if you're retired, I mean, I don't get that. You're so, like, you're so active. <laughs> I wonder how you were before you retired from the main job. But Zabine, I would like to have a reflection from you. I think we heard it also from uh, Mohammed uh, Faki, that in a way the, the pandemic has been how a lens magnifying the negative things, but perhaps also hopefully the positive things. But looking more at the negative things, we've seen, um, yeah, a lot of the inequality and injustice that we have also in a country like Canada that I, I also think very highly of being exposed from the pandemic. And one wonders whether, uh, whether this can really become a lever for change. Um, and for making things better. Terrific, uh, thank you so much, Anna. And it's uh, such a pleasure to be here um, on this uh, panel with, uh, with uh, just a, a great group of panelists that, uh, that you brought together. Um, and, uh, you know, I think to there, I, I'll, I'll start with a positive framing, but then get into some of the issues that have arisen. And one of the things that, uh, that Mohammed spoke about was just how we have really come together. Um, you know, we've united in this common purpose, common predicament as, as a country. And one of the, the reasons for that is we have, regardless of, of who you are, and while yes, the, the, the health outcomes of the pandemic do vary by group, but at some fundamental level, at a human level, uh, we have all connected because we are all experiencing um, something through the pandemic. And so the power of that uh, is something, when I talk about future of work, that I certainly, and future of leadership, uh, we talk a lot about how do we bottle that and how do we use that energy and power that's been created to really move us to building back a more inclusive uh, economy and a more inclusive society. Uh, we all have our stories. I too have my story. That's not what this session is about, but at a, just at a you know, 60,000 foot level, I came to Canada as a teenager from Tanzania, which is where I was born. My, my uh, grandparents moved to um, East Africa from India. So I come from a family of immigrants and, uh, and have had uh, the, the good fortune of a good story. I started as a, teller to, as a teller at RBC three years after I came to Canada um, and, uh, and 40 years later uh, retired as the chief human resources officer and one of the top uh, eight in the company. And just to clarify it, I was nine when I started. So, you know, for those mathematicians in there, Doug, you're probably adding up the numbers, um, I, 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 I'm still uh, quite young, let's just say. Um, so, so what's happened? I think you've, you've sort of asked me uh, three questions in there. One is really how have organizations responded? And I will say three things. Uh, the conversation, first of all, has shifted from this lack of awareness or even denial uh, that systemic racism exists. It's now really moving to it's there and what can we do about it? So leaders are more open to listening, to suspending judgment, to learning, and just getting more comfortable being uncomfortable as we understand what these issues are and also uh, take uh, really um, very deliberate actions to move that needle. And what I'm also seeing is this reframing from diversity and inclusion to diversity, equity and inclusion. And language is really important. Um, equity means that uh, people, we need to take special actions, we need to do uh, different things in order to create that level playing field. 
And uh, that is something that we need to get more comfortable with because people, groups that face more barriers require different ways um, in, in order for them to fully participate in, in the labor market. And one of the things you, you know, you talked about some of the, the dark side of this, and there is a backlash. We know that, uh, you know, we need to be honest about that. We need to be candid about that, where people have concerns about reverse discrimination. And uh, the narrative here needs to be very um, clearly communicated that this is really about um, economic success. It's about social, uh, creating social impact and economic and social prosperity are really two sides of the same coin. And as a country, um, we need really to, to tap into, to unleash the full potential of everyone. And I think Doug made a good point where the health crisis is our uh, primary focus right now, but we have to be managing on you know, all of the different dimensions in order for us to, to come out stronger. So I'd really like to see the commitments that organizations have made um, in good faith to really turn um, into outcomes. Uh, Deloitte, we wrote a report actually two or three years ago uh, from optics to outcomes. And that's really the story that um, we need the accountability and the, the, the results that we need to see. Um, I, you know, what I also picked up in your question was really uh, just around where are organizations at in terms of really seeing the value of diversity, but more specifically newcomers. And I'll say a couple of things around that. I would say we're certainly moved, uh, moving along that continuum. But what I'm also seeing as um, different sectors, as we've mentioned, as Doug has mentioned, have been, have been impacted in different ways. And as they're looking for growth, as they're looking for that economic growth, that business growth, the, um, the, the immigrant population is clearly a big part of that story. Uh, we, have, you know, we have in the last five years welcomed you know, around you know, 250 to 300,000 uh, new immigrants. Obviously the pandemic here was different. Our forecast looking forward is even bigger numbers to make up for some of this um, some of this gap. And so it's not, you know, businesses really do see that that market that matters. And that is one of the things that um, that is driving not just business strategy, but I've said this before to win in the market, you need to hire the market. Uh, you really need to reflect your customers in order to best serve them and, uh, and, and to build your business. So one thing here that, that I would like to see more of, I, I do, you know, having been in industry my, my uh, entire career, I do bring a very practical lens. And one thing I would like to see is really managing this intersectionality. When we talk about diversity, we have gender, we have race, um, but new immigrants bring an additional layer of intersectionality uh, just um, around what needs to be different in order to, to more fully integrate uh, immigrants into their workforce, to more fully use, um, um, and Mohammed uh, Lashimi earlier spoke about um, you know, his, his taxi driver story. And we know uh, there's a study done by RBC that put the the size of the prize at $50 billion a year, if we can fully use the, the, the skills and talents of immigrants, those that are underemployed, those that are unemployed, and the wage gap, which uh, a recent Deloitte report showed at 29% for new immigrants. Closing um, those elements have this $50 billion size of the prize. And so, how do we change that narrative as well in the general public? Because with the economic situation that we're in, we are in danger of um, perhaps Canadians having um, less support to, um, to, for immigration and also less support to help for the integration into the, uh, into the workforce. But this really is about our future. Our population is aging. 
people over 65 will double by 2030 to close to 22% of our population. Uh, we are a large country um, with a small population. And uh, so for me, that really, that narrative and shifting that um, is, is really important um, and bringing that intersectionality lenses within organizations and having special programs. I'll flag a couple of things there before I close off. Um, you mentioned my connection to TRIAC. They have a report coming out in a couple of weeks that I had a chance to weigh in on. Um, really, it's called Make or Break, How Middle Managers and Executives Can Build Inclusive um, uh, to build immigrant inclusive teams because you need to take very uh, deliberate action. Um, and we need to look at some of these programs in terms of how we can scale them. I know that uh, uh, my uh, other good friend, Claudia Hepburn is here from Windmill Micro Lending. Again, you know, we see outcome-based programs. Um, we need those partnerships. Mohammed spoke about business and uh, community and government coming together. Um, so I will, you know, uh, put that on the table as well. Uh, but really to close off and where we started around COVID having shown this light on systemic injustice, particularly around race, particularly around um, anti-Black racism. And for us, of course, um, anti-Indigenous racism as well. Uh, but we are need, we're gonna need to manage diversity and its complexity in looking at gender and looking at race and in and looking at new immigrants because ultimately uh, this is not just the right thing to do it's the smart thing to do it's about building inclusive prosperity for us for the mid and uh, and and long term Thank you very much, Alvin. So, um, and I'm glad also that in the shadows you also see the lights. And it's um, it's true that I think that, again the pandemic is of course a crisis, but can also provide the opportunity for business community and the government to come together into addressing these long-term concerns of people underemployment, this killing, um, and you know as you said, talent loss. But um, before I, I give some of my observations, I'd like to, to invite Jean-Christophe Dumont from OECD to give us a little bit of view from other OECD countries. Is really Canada unique in seeing immigration as part of the recovery or are other OECD countries going um, along the same path? Thank you, uh, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation and uh, Yes, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge to, to compare Canada because maybe when you look at, uh, at the country from where you stand, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, things to, uh, but, that you think you can improve. But uh, if you compare to other countries, uh, then obviously, as Mohammed said, uh, Canada looks really like a great country in many respects. Um, uh, it's, it's currently in our OECD countries, all about health, uh, to be frank. It's about, uh, and a little bit in, in, in the spirit of what Duke said, that uh, uh, the, you know, combating the, the virus uh, and the enormous uh, human cost that comes with it, uh, preventing the spread of the virus is really, uh, let's say, the number one priority everywhere else in the OECD. Uh, and, and you can see that uh, the discussion is certainly not about uh, the future of migration, but it's currently about border closures and how to make sure that uh, people who are uh, coming in uh, will not contribute to, to spreading the, the virus. Even, I would say, uh, the behind the scene or, or more public conversation on vaccine uh, passport and and other tools to uh, resume mobility uh, are, are not uh, making any progress uh, at, at the political level because again, uh, all, all the, the focus is on the health uh, crisis. Um, but obviously the focus is also on the economic crisis. Uh, uh, what is probably unique in this crisis compared to the previous one is the uh, the speed and the strength uh, with which uh, OECD countries have responded with large stimulus package with uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, job uh, retention schemes. Uh, they have put uh, almost 11 trillion uh, uh, dollars on the table uh, to, to save the, the economy. Uh, but we, we also know uh, that uh, the, the full impact uh, will be only visible in, in a few months or years, uh, because as uh, it was said before, a number of businesses are maintaining uh, their activity by borrowing uh, money and whether that's going to be sustainable in the long term remains to be seen and basically depends on on the uh, 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 on the sustainability of the support and the speed of the recovery. Uh, from from that perspective, Canada is is uh, is relatively well placed. I mean, from OECD figures, it seems that the uh, uh, the drop in GDP in 2020 was uh, five five 4 uh, percent, which which is a large drop indeed, uh, but uh, also much less than in Europe. Well, in the Eurozone, uh, it was 7.5%. Was it minus 11% in the UK, minus 9% in France or Italy? A number of European countries are uh, much uh, harder hit from the economic uh, perspective already. And, uh, and um, the, the prospect for recovery in Canada, uh, as, as uh, if I believe the OECD figures at least, uh, for 2021 is 3.5%. And again, this is larger than, than some of these European countries where, where the rebound will be much weaker. So in that perspective, uh, I think it, it's, uh, it, it looks probably, it's, it's not the end of the story for sure, but uh, the prospects are, are looking a bit better in, in, in Canada than in some other uh, OECD countries. Uh, the flows, migration flows, have, have decreased everywhere very significantly, minus 50% on average in the, in the OECD, and Canada is, is in that average. Uh, uh, but when you look forward, uh, yes, Canada is the only country which is already thinking about migration in its recovery plan. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's really uh, uh, very... Uh, Fascinating to see that uh, the government of Canada has uh, increased its target numbers uh, for a three-year plan starting from uh, 2021. Uh, the numbers are really big. We're talking about uh, 400,000 uh, people this year. Um, and uh, what, what uh, I think also enables uh, that political move is, is the nature and the tone of the public debate in, in Canada. Indeed, there are some uh, issues to be improved. Uh, Canada is not immune to uh, uh, racism and, and other challenges that uh, are more probably uh, pregnant in other OECD countries. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there, there is a very positive debate, as, as we could see from the previous intervention uh, uh, in, in the Canadian uh, uh, com uh, community and society on, on, on migration. And, and that is unique, almost. Uh, there are very few OECD countries now where there is no uh, strong anti-immigrant uh, parties, where the debate is on how to make more of uh, uh, immigrant skills rather than how to reduce immigration. And, and, and so I think this is a very different tone uh, and, and uh, that will uh, largely contribute to uh, the attractivity of Canada going forward. Uh, so clearly some countries, uh, first, first of them, the, the US have made a U-turn on, on their migration policy. So we back to, to the pre-Trump area, uh, but uh, even in that configuration, uh, it's, it's unclear that the numbers will necessarily increase significantly in the US. Canada will probably be uh, in, a, in an excellent position compared to other OECD countries to attract talents, particularly this year in 2021, if the recovery uh, uh, is, is actually happening uh, somehow. I would not be surprised to see uh, more and more people uh, targeting Canada more and more highly skilled people choosing to come to Canada. And actually the pool uh, for the express entry system 
drawing, even if it has been a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it went through diet last, last week, if I understood correctly. But, but that pool uh, has the potential to grow. And here the challenge will be going forward uh, regarding highly skilled migration for Canada to be able to select, um, uh, let's say, a set of skills that correspond to, to the reality of the Canadian economy and not only scream uh, those with the highest points always, uh, but, but have a skill mix in, their, in its immigration that correspond to, to the need uh, of the economy. Um, I think uh, in terms of, of a future of migration to Canada, there is probably two areas where uh, it's probably more uncertain. Um, one is uh, the temporary foreign worker program, which has been decreasing already quite a bit in the past few years. Uh, most of this program is uh, subject to labor market impact assessment. And certainly in the current context, it's going to be much more difficult for people to go through this labor market impact assessment. So it's, it's, it's hard to say, um, but maybe uh, uh, the numbers there will, will uh, be more on, on the decline. Uh, keeping in mind that it also includes some, some uh, let's say, sectors or occupation uh, which are essential for the Canadian economy, like the seasonal agricultural worker program or long-term caregiver uh, to, to some extent. So, it will not go to zero uh, for sure, but, but there, there can be some tensions there. And the other thing uh, which is a bit uncertain, I, I believe, is on the student front. And it was uh, very well mentioned by uh, the president uh, uh, in his uh, uh, keynote address welcoming remarks. Um, this uh, Canada has been increasing the number of international students uh, really tremendously, tripling the numbers in 10 years. It has now on, on, almost as many as Australia. Uh, uh, this has become a, a very strong uh, component uh, in building the talent pipeline to the express entry and the, and the permanent system. Uh, but this is, uh, this is an area where things will change drastically. Uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, is that there, there, there is competition in all OECD countries to attract international students. And some countries like France, for example, have made a very significant exception, including during the pandemic and have facilitated the, the uh, arrival of international students. Other, uh, uh, notably I'm thinking about the UK, uh, will will probably uh, take steps to to maintain their market share, uh, despite the fact that they are leaving uh, leaving uh, the European Union. Uh, China is also very aggressive in, in that market, uh, and and so I think it's a question also because of uh, distance learning and change in in the practices, and maybe also some some young people would be less. Uh, inclined to, to move uh, with, with a virus and all the risk uh, and, and maybe the, the more difficult uh, transitioning uh, to, to a work permit afterwards. So this is an area where, again, Canada has a lot of advantages, is in a in very good position, but uh, I would suspect that we're gonna see big changes uh, in the next two or three years. In you know who's going to be the, the losers and, and the winners here? Uh, it's it's hard to say. Um, I, I I just uh, hope that uh, um, OECD country will will still offer opportunity for uh, improve their education and training for people from non OECD country uh, um, because this is also part of uh, uh, the assistance that OECD countries is providing to less developed countries uh, through opening their education system. I stop you there. Thank you very much. Jean Christophe, thank you very much because you really gave kind of you did an anatomy of the immigration system and even the immigration narratives in Canada. And that is very interesting and also trying to put things in perspective also in terms of the economic um, crisis and, and the way the recovery may shape up. While our, our audience is gathering their thoughts and um, I take the opportunity to invite them to write their questions in the chat, I'd like to take the advantage of being the chairperson and, and ask a couple of questions. So I have one question for, for Doug 
Um, I have thought when I saw the, the announcement of uh, Minister Mandicino that we, we would be aiming in the next three years for higher, even uh, higher numbers of permanent immigrants, let alone the temporary, or perhaps they were anticipating what John Christophe just said, that the temporary foreign worker program would come into a certain, um, into certain problems. So uh, that was also partly the idea. I thought it was a Keynesian approach. So you invest, you create more uh, expenditure because you have to beef up the settlement sector. These people will come, they will consume, they will buy, they will rent, they, um, you know, they'll send their kids to school. So, but, but you seem to think that, or you seem to say that it's tiny in, in relation to the recovery. So my question to you is, is it so tiny that it is in, in, insignificant in terms of a Keynesian approach? And do you think the government had more in mind something about innovation and about um, you know, growth in that sense rather than actual growth because more people are coming and as Amina was saying, we're an ancient society? So thank you for that question. Uh, just to be clear, it's, it's not tiny in normal circumstances. It's actually quite an important part of um, you know, just looking at, say, from a Keynesian element, as, as you said, uh, look, you know, looking at a, you know, in, in a normal year, the Canadian economy might grow by about 2% or so. That, that, that's actually almost a good year um, in, in this day and age. And so, of course, if, if you're talking about population growth on the order of about 1% or, or more, as I said, in 2019, the population grew by 1.5%. It's, it's an enormous part of uh, growth in, in a typical year. Um, it's tiny stacked up against the trauma through which the overall economy and the global economy, not just in Canada, went through last year. Um, Jean Christophe mentioned that uh, when all is said and done, the Canadian economy probably shrunk by about five and a half percent last year. That's that's the biggest decline we've we've seen in the post-war era. Um, you know, even even the brutal recessions of the early 80s, 90s, 2008, 2009, were not as big a drop as as that. So it just stacked up against those ex that extreme circumstance, but. No, I don't. I don't mean to downplay at all the uh, the importance of the immigration element in in Canada's medium term growth outlook. It just stacked up against the size of this one particular event, which I would almost characterize as being like a natural disaster that's still going on to this day. Um, but no, it's it's. I, I I do think you know there there are a number of different angles that uh, I think the government is forming their immigration policy. But I do think the the Keynesian part of it, the 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 demand supportive part of it, is is a big is a big portion of that. Well, thank you very much, Doug. And I have a, a, a question for, for Mohammed. Um, do, you, uh, do you think that new immigration will be beneficial to the wider caterism, catering sector? Um, and you know, how do you see the resilience of people? Do you have any concrete ideas that we could uh, put forward to the government about how they could help the businesses? Because and correct me if I'm wrong, I would think that in Canada, we've had a very robust program supporting employees, uh, but probably the, the different measures that have been important in supporting entrepreneurs have come later, more complicated. So the picture is more mixed. Well, um, I would like to answer or comment on a couple of things were said actually, including what you just mentioned. So as you know, I'm part of the, uh, 15 CEO council that created by Canadian Chamber of Commerce uh, for Canada economic recovery. And definitely the help that the federal government has given uh, businesses, it kept us and it kept a lot of small businesses in business. I don't get subsidies. I'm a bigger uh, chain uh, franchising and everything, but some of the small location do. And it has helped us. It came late, it came slow. Uh, there's a lot of offering of borrowing where I actually warn on deep borrowing, including banks did that these small businesses should not continue borrowing because the economic, re economic recovery, like uh, John Christophe said, is going to be dependent on what's going to happen after what, when we all think that we're done, uh, more bankruptcies might come and economic recovery might be slower because of these debts piling up and the subsidies removed then they're on their own and they'll fall faster. So on that point, definitely uh, helping the staff is great to keep them safe. Uh, we need to find other ways to actually number one, uh, advertise like we 
advertised not to go to retailers, not to go to restaurants. We have to reverse that. So we make sure that those businesses are supported. So we need Dr. Tam and all the doctors that advertise that we're, restaurants are not safe and malls are not safe to start doing the opposite. When the health, uh, whatever recovery is back. So that's number one, very important thing. And I think businesses will need 14 to 18 month uh, subsidy after they are fully open for business so they can balance their cash flow and stay in business. So that's very important. As far as uh, John Christophe comment about, uh, it's a good news to hear that Canada is in better shape because we're talking how we're gonna actually uh, give bigger opportunity to immigrants. And instead of, does it exist that some parties do not do not want immigrants? We need to be honest about what we're facing in Canada. We do have some parties that definitely came after four years of what happened in the United States. And there is some hate that it, some hate group that they are growing and that's why the government is tackling them. I, for one, got attacked by a hate group because of what I do. And we need to be protecting the newcomers and immigrants for them to perform. We can't have them in a situation where intimidated and they do not want to really be at their best. And that's where we lead to the 2% of economic impact from the immigration because they will be just happy to be taxi driver because they do not want to be growing and succeeding and being shy to do that because they're going to be attacked and they're going to be intimidated by their skills. And yes, Doug is right. Uh, on the immediate impact on the short term, yes, definitely it's very minor and minimal. But I think if Canada gives better and bigger and faster opportunity to the immigrant and the refugee, I think that 2% will grow year over year. Because what's happening now, we bring people, we accept them here, and it takes them three to five years to get their proper opportunity to show their skills and their impact. And one by one, that's happening to them, including me. It happened to me. It took me three years. That's why what Cla Claudia uh, does in her business in Windmill is very important. You lend them money. We lend them money to get them on their way, not we leave them for three to four years before they show their impact. It's a drop by drop, the impact will grow bigger. So let's don't underestimate what's happening from the Haiti groups and how it impacts psychologically the immigrant and the newcomer for them to perform. Let's underestimate what we've done in the past. And that's the dog is 2%. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right, right? So our 2%, it could become five fast. Right, but, but, but the 2% is coming for what we've done and how we treated immigrants the last uh, four or five years because it's on average, right? But if we were to welcome them to the boardrooms, if we were to welcome them faster to show their skills, that 2% will grow faster and will show more impact. Our solution to our labor market issue is having more immigrant and more refugee. And there is a lot of studies that show that we just need to support them better. We simply need to support them and believe that we are better we, when we are together. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed. I, I want to be optimistic. I, I do think this is, um, you know, common wisdom in Canada. And as uh, Jean Christophe was pointing out, and I, since I also spend most of my time, my working time in different European countries, and certainly there is a different, a completely different narrative. Um, in Canada, well, to the best of my personal understanding, also to, um, in relation to the US. Um, and, and we've seen this, um, this discussion going on during the last years under the Trump administration that Canada was having a competitive advantage in attracting uh, more skilled people. But I'd like to ask as I've been um, a question in relation to how I mean, it's uh, again, we need a crystal ball and I try myself to read this crystal ball. What, what happens in terms of how we work? Of course, this, this um, what, I mean, reading about how our workplace is changing, um, a lot of people who work in digital technologies would say uh, the future has come fast forward in 10 years, like 10 years fast forward in six months because we all have had to work from home and to work remotely and connect and we've been unable to travel. But would this have, a really important impact, for instance, on all of what we were saying about the benefits of being together. I mean, the diversity brings more talent, brings, brings more creativity, brings more resilience. Can this remote aspect 
kind of dilute the the relevance of, of diversity and creativity? The, uh, the, the whole issue of uh, working from home, working from anywhere, um, I would start by saying that we, we have to think about the current um, environment as, a, as really a learning crucible because we're not living in normal times. Um, but, um, you know, having said that, um, I think directly to your question around the value of, of uh, diversity, when you're working in, um, in an environment like we are right now, uh, is it harder to be inclusive and is it harder to actually um, have that creativity and that innovation? And I think the where organizations are really thinking and moving on that and, and why they're moving that way is to more of a hybrid kind of an environment where people will work part, part of the time from home, part of the time from a specific location where they come together because we haven't yet figured out a way for whether it's just the, you know, just the sort of serendipitous creativity and innovation, uh, the, the power of, of people actually coming together. Um, so I do see some kind of a hybrid um, uh, coming out of that. But having said that, I think one of the things we need to also talk about here is that there are certain skills that work very well in a work from anywhere environment. And will we see um, organizations tapping into those skills for people in other countries who may otherwise have come to Canada and you know, been residents of Canada, contributed to Canada, um, in, in terms of taxpayers and other, other social contributions that they make uh, because they choose not to live here because the environment isn't going to be as friendly to immigrants. So, you know, the, the complexity here and have really having to think about that uh, becomes um, um, important, as I mentioned earlier, to bring that intersectionality lens of what are the impacts to our immigration policy and the value that we look to derive from there. Um, I did want to make one comment on the other things we, we just talked about. Um, and while our focus is on immigration in the future, uh, and I think Mohammed touched on, we have a lot of new immigrants in this country that are underutilized today. Uh, so if you even just look at the last five years, you know, it's over a million people, plus all the international students that, um, that come to Canada. So, and, and we certainly have a pathway, I think that, um, I, you know, I don't know how many countries have that kind of easier pathway, but it's one that, that we have created here. And so what we're talking about is for organizations to unlock the potential of the immigrants that are already in their organizations and also uh, that um, are, you know, that are essentially underemployed, under contributing because they're not taking the actions to the, to really build that sense of belonging, that sense of um, being able to contribute because we do have to do special things to bring out the best in everyone. And um, that to me is the opportunity that, that I would say immediately in the recovery, it doesn't cost anything. Um, but the value creation capacity isn't there. And healthcare is a great example where we've seen because of the demand, we have seen faster pathways um, because we need more healthcare workers to look at internationally trained healthcare workers and get them trained up faster um, to, to move them in, in, into, uh, into that sort of environment. And, and what other opportunities are there where those pathways can be built, where we can be more creative in more fully employing um, immigrants so that they are uh, contributing in a different way. And what we also know is immigrants are, you know, they are, in general, they're bigger risk takers, they're more entrepreneurial, they 
come to a different country to make a different life, they've taken a big, a big risk. In many situations, they are not necessarily fleeing. Um, you know, they're not uh, fleeing something that um, that is un unlivable. I mean, in the you know, when my parents or my my family moved here, it was to make a better future for the next generation, and so they immigrants will go um, all out and really push the boundaries to be successful. And right now we need that entrepreneurialism, that risk taking in large organizations, as well as in the public sector. Let's not forget the public sector is a huge employer in this country and often our conversations focus just on business um, and bringing them in, not just as policymakers, but also as uh, employers, I think is, um, is, uh, is important. And that I, I would see as an immediate opportunity for us to focus on, uh, which some of the organizations we talked about are doing. No, thank you very much. I mean, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, yeah, there is something to be said that, uh, that we, we also discussed before with Mohammed that, that there is a certain dynamism and resilience that we find in, in migrants. And I would say we find it regardless of their level of formal skills, <clears throat> whether they're university educated or not. Because as you said, whether you're driven um, by a choice, I mean, how much your choice was constrained or voluntary, that it takes courage. Uh, to move for sure. I, I see, you know, the, the chat is, is really populated and I, I, I would like to, to come to a couple, at least a couple of questions from the chat. So one is, um, uh, some people are asking, is, is the system too complicated in, in Canada? Um, so that, that is one question. So the navigating the, and, I, and I would jokingly, um, you know, respond. My short answer is yes. I think you need certainly a PhD to, to navigate the system. No, I think that the system is complicated at the same time. It is efficient too. But I would like to, um, uh, to ask on this Jean-Christophe because I know he has a kind of a comparative overview of comparable immigration systems. And it is my personal view that the Canadian system has so many categories that even us researchers, perhaps the lawyers can sort them out, but even us researchers, sometimes we ask each other, so did I miss there is a category for this or for that? There's really many, many immigration categories which actually cater to very different situations and profiles. So they are understood in being uh, flexible, but the question is, do they become too complicated? And I want to ask Jean-Christophe also another kind of million dollar question that has been asked in the chat. Is it really a wise thing to bring more people um, during a recession? We heard also from Doug the numbers, so we heard from Mohammed the challenges. So yes, unemployment is not terrible, Doug. I know 9% for Canada is terrible unemployment. For many other countries, it's not that terrible, but it's still, it's nearly double what it was. So is it a good idea or will this lead to pockets of poverty and inequality because people will come in at the moment where there are no jobs? And of course, the best way to start your new life is not to go on, on welfare benefit. So what, what is your take, Jean-Christophe? Well, let me start with, uh, with the first question, Anna. Um, well, indeed, the, the Canadian system has uh, as multiple channels of entry, um, but uh, and and may may look complicated uh, in the sense of uh, that behind the system there is a big uh, infrastructure uh, to manage the system and to manage it well. Um, but I I would argue that in comparison to uh, to the U.S. system. Uh, as it is, uh, or to what is uh, in place in many European countries, uh, it's much more transparent. Uh, it's it's fairer in many ways, uh, and and uh, it also it's also well thought from from the sense of, of a variety of the needs. I mean, we 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 talk about permanent migration, the still federal program but but the, the provincial nominee programs are uh, almost as big by by now uh, there, there, there has been some pilot programs uh, 
for Atlantic provinces. I mean, we haven't really talked about that. We, we I think for, for the time being, the discussion has been uh, looking at Canada as, as one single economic entity, uh, uh, but, but uh, there are huge differences across provinces be, between uh, uh, large cities and, and rural areas in, in terms of a dynamic, uh, economic dynamic and, and our skills needs for sure. Um, I, I think it's, yes, the system is, is somehow complicated but, but it's also far to address this, this diversity of needs, which you, you will fail to, to find in, in, in some other models. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, some European countries are, are much smaller and, and, and the issues are, are not, uh, not exactly the same. Um, I think the Canadian, mod, the Canadian model is actually a model. It's not a model that was invented by Canada, but by New Zealand copied by Australia and, and that Canada has applied uh, just before Quebec uh, uh, also <laughs> adopted a, a similar uh, expression uh, of interest system. Now Europe, uh, the European Commission is uh, looking at uh, uh, transporting uh, this approach to, to the EU. So, I, you know, there, there are many arguments to say that, that uh, this, this is a good model in, in many ways, even if uh, uh, it can only work uh, with a big infrastructure uh, uh, behind. Um, the, uh, the second question is, uh, is, is very, very complex, but uh, uh, I, I think that uh, what is clear is that, uh, yeah, well, I, I think there are two sides. One is that clearly uh, past uh, expense has, has shown that when people arrive during a recession, they, they tend to, uh, to uh, face care in the labor market. They, they perform less well than if they arrive during uh, uh, an expansion period. So I, I think this is true and this is a challenge. It doesn't mean that people will fail. It, it's just that it takes them more time uh, to, to catch up uh, uh, and, and everyone can understand why. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's clear that uh, when people arrive, they are also creating the demand. The first thing they need is, is, uh, is uh, a roof and, and, uh, and to eat and, and, and to manage, uh, you know, buy furniture and, and all these things. So uh, for that, uh, this is also contributing to, to the economy. Uh, we have uh, a few examples uh, 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 along these lines. Uh, if you look at the uh, EU enlargement uh, in, in 2004, um, you know, before that, uh, there was no sign of the UK economy uh, facing any sort of, uh, uh, you know, large shortages, uh, increasing wage or, or things like this. There was, there was no indication that the UK economy was uh, uh, very hot, uh, but, but still more than 1 million people came from Europe and, and there was absolutely no impact on, on wage whatsoever, only uh, growth, uh, GDP growth. It has enabled the UK economy to offer new services that were not available before, like more extended uh, opening hours in, in the businesses and so on and so forth. It has created value. Uh, if you look at the, the 1 million uh, plus uh, refugee that came to Germany in, in 2015, 16, some of them uh, with skills, uh, uh, very highly skilled, also uh, about 40% with quite low level of skills and obviously no German proficiency. Uh, this one million people have created wealth in Germany as well. It, it takes time. It, it has required a huge investment from the German government uh, to, to make sure that people learn the language, that they can uh, uh, you know, get additional qualification and find their way on the labor market. I think the job is not finished there, but uh, certainly no negative sign on, on the economy. Again, if, if as it was said before, uh, the inflow of people is accompanied by supporting measures uh, that will help people realize their potential. Yes, it's probably more difficult during a recession time, uh, 
but uh, maybe 2021 will not be a recession time for Canada, but the, the time of, uh, of a recovery and the rebound. Thank you. I think, Dr. Sobier, we needed to, we needed to hear it. Uh, we need to hear it from outside that um, uh, we're we're doing well and and to be more positive. And I um, actually that's a great example. Not only the uh, so-called big bang enlargement of the European Union in 2004. Um, just for those that may not be fully familiar with this, the EU was 15 member states in 2004, and it enlarged to another 10. So, and there was significant uh, migration within the European Union because that, that was that is part of the deal, so to speak, when countries uh, become members. Um, so, and it was kind of spontaneous migration. And as, as Dr. Christoph was explaining, one of the main uh, destination countries was the UK and also Ireland. If you remember, that was perhaps known as an emigration country, not an immigration country. Um, so so that, that is a very important and interesting example that we should keep in mind. I want to ask one question to Mohamed Faki that I've seen in the chat and it's very dear to me. We know the restaurant industry had a shortage of both skill, highly skilled and low skilled workers before the pandemic hit. We know now the, the situation is almost reversed for both highly and, and less skilled people. Um, do you expect, Mohammed, that there will be a, so, so like right now, for instance, with some colleagues, one of whom is here, we're planning to, to start a project looking at how can people be helped in, you know, showing resilience, be retrained, do something different within the sector, move to a different sector. Uh, but then we also realize that maybe by the time we've done our research, the, the industry has bounced back and there's more shortages. What, what is your view from within? the sector well uh one more time a uh, couple things were going on on the chat as well that they're very interesting to you and well probably i can sum them up including the answer to your questions so uh, to the person who was asking about the canadian experience i said it's a very polite excuse that entrepreneurs and uh, companies has to say you don't have a canadian experience it's a good hr answer to say we actually not open to invest in you and to invest in your potential. So that's the bottom line. I mean, I, I had somebody who actually used me to work for free, great person now, and we have a friendship and I always tease him about them hiring me for free as a gemologist. But after six months, when I got another offer, he actually gave me a great offer and made my life better. But he needed to actually uh, first employ me for free, wouldn't invest in me just because I still have my accent and I'm going to keep it forever because it's a conversation opener and I want to keep my accent and that should not stop my employment. So people do use it as an excuse. Uh, trust me, you do not want to have uh, a company that you work inside as your first job in Canada. If at the start, they need an excuse before they are honest to say, maybe our culture needs to change and we should be more welcoming to your skills maybe like who is a CEO that seek opportunity and think that the staff are from the same place, they look alike, but they grew up in the same place can bring a creativity together. It doesn't even make sense, right? So there's a problem in their culture and you don't need that company to hire you, trust me. You're better off actually waiting until you get the second offer from a better company. You don't need people like this and they need mentorship and we're open to give them mentorship and the power of immigrant and refugee on the workplace. So that's one. Two, you're absolutely right. The second person that said, some people think that immigrants are allowed only to occupy certain jobs, but not to reach the top, right? And applies the same answer, right? There is something wrong with that culture. There is something wrong with their knowledge. And I don't think they actually deserve to lead a company in a country like Canada, where we all look different and eat different and we, celebrate different occasions, right? And we keep saying, let's celebrate each other's occasion. Let's befriend people from different backgrounds. Hopefully those CEOs that lead our economic recovery opens up their heart, open up these skills. They give them opportunities. And we saw what happened with the medical doctors. Like there's a lot of doctors that until now they haven't heard back. They're ready to do the job of a nurse and they didn't get to be heard back. And for the restaurant industry, we'll always need people. 
we will always need people. We're hiring now, okay? And we will unlock, uh, we will continue uh, needing people. You're right, we wanted low-skilled people and even high-skilled people. Unfortunately, with the restaurant industry, a lot of people don't think it's a job forever. Not a lot of them do. So they think it's a temporary job like we do with our children. We send them to work at a different restaurant than Paramount so they can actually keep them, like give them some difficult time so they can see the, the appreciate the, the work place and respect that. But it's very, very important to understand this industry will always support employment. The restaurant industry will always need a staff. I'll never forget, we were me and the Minister of uh, Immigration and people were coming and saying, we just need workers, people that will do the jobs even in the back kitchens. So absolutely, this industry will always need people. Even now, there's even like, there's not a lot of the people in the industry that they're sitting at home, definitely equal to the rest of the percentage of the country. But despite that, we're devastated. So. Definitely, this industry will always support the community and will always hire. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and indeed, it's a labor intensive industry. And as you said, there's uh, so many different jobs. And I think we only became aware of how important it is through the pandemic because we realized also how many other sectors are interrelated with, uh, uh, you know, with restaurants and catering. But let me also come back to you. You also touched uh, briefly upon it, Mohammed. But uh, there's a question hovering in the chat about does Canada need low skilled or highly skilled people, um, or both actually? And I want to turn uh, uh, this question to Doug. Although I, I have to say that that was a, like he he always said, um, you know, I'm I'm a chief economist. I'm not an immigration expert. But I would like to ask you that if you think of the forecast for the Canadian economy. Um, and I think part of this forecast, and even if we bracket out a little bit the pandemic, is one of, um, uh, you know, a digital technological future of, um, you know, and what we call a knowledge-based knowledge economy and society. So how do you, I mean, if you were to give a really direct answer, um, does Canada need only highly skilled people because we're trying to transition in different sectors in higher automation, more advanced technologies, actually more advanced products? Or do we also need uh, lower skilled um, people for, for instance, I'm thinking the big urban centers and the law service uh, jobs that are always there, or of course, also the, the primary sector, which we have seen how important it has been the agri-food industry um, during the pandemic. What is your view? So I think in a way you've just answered the question. I think I think we need both. I I, I think we need uh, right across the, uh, the the spectrum. Um, it's interesting. A lot of people have uh, spoken about, you know, how we aren't fully utilizing the the skills of uh, of of our immigrant pop population. But I think that's true of the entire population. We have a very well educated society. Um, there there are a lot of people probably working below what their education levels would would suggest. And just from a from a very, very bigger picture view, you know, coming coming into this, Canada had uh, you know I, I mentioned before that two percent growth would be would be good. We've we've had a a horrible productivity record, and this has been an issue really since I've been an economist. And you know, it's it's an issue we've been grappling with for decades and decades. And I, I am somewhat hopeful that uh, in in a way, it's so it's almost as if we've been shocked a bit by this event. Uh, you know, whether it's at the individual level or at the corporate level, um, you know, many people have said this has brought the future into, into the present. And I'm hopeful that we're, we're going to have a little bit of a productivity shock as, as a result of, uh, of, of this, which is, you know, is, is potentially good for, for everyone. Um, but uh, bringing it back to your question, um, I, you know, I, I, I believe that, uh, that we need all, all kinds of skills. Um, it, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be completely focused on just just high skill. We also shouldn't just be focused on, you know, bringing in low skilled workers either. It, uh, I, I, I believe it should be the full spectrum. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I'm conscious of time. So we have three more minutes and I think I'll give this last three minutes. Of, I mean, I, a question to Zabin. It, it's again a question that's hovering uh, through the chat. Is Canadian experience, and I think Mohammed partly gave us um, an answer, is Canadian experience an excuse? Is just a way to discriminate against people? Um, is it true? Some people in the chat say, yeah, I mean, you have to learn the ropes and I'll confess to that. 
Um, even though I moved within my own sector and taken up a new job, and even though I had been to Canada before, I had worked with a lot of Canadian colleagues, it's been a steep learning curve, particularly the first year from everything, from the basics of the administration in a new big university to the way things are being done around here. And I'll, uh, actually, I can also um, here excuse myself for, with my team, because I often, in, particularly in the beginning, I hope I don't do that much, I, I can say, oh, but I was used to do this in this way. Oh, we did this in this way. And Jean-Christophe, you can say, oh, in the EU, oh, in, I lived in Italy for a long time before coming here. Oh, we did these things in this way. And, and of course, I was very lucky. I had the luxury to say that because otherwise it's just shut up and see to learn how we do things around here. But I think the question remains, how much Canadian experience is a true asset and a true request, or is it really... Um, you know, a polite, how did Mohammed say a polite way to say, I don't want to invest in you? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the blunt answer to this is that most times Canadian experience is, is used um, as a way not to hire someone who doesn't have Canadian experience. And, and I can remember going back um, decades now, um, um, when we first started doing work with new immigrants at the bank, and, um, and we were hiring, you know, we do, uh, I still say we because that's where I was my whole, uh, my whole life, but, you know, the bank was hiring, uh, we hire lots of people in, in, in the branch network, and um, that's where Canadian experience was, uh, was, was being used, and, you know, we paused there, and I said, let's just stop to think about it. You have 10 people in your branch that have Canadian experience you are going to bring in an 11th person who do you want exactly the same kind of person on your team or do you want to expand your team capacity bringing someone in who has experience in another country and guess what many of our clients are new immigrants wouldn't it be great to have someone who has the new immigrant experience who can um, help can really empathize with what it, what it's like to be coming to a new country. Banking is a business of trust. Through these conversations, you can build trust. Um, and 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 also a lot of uh, new immigrants have relationships in their communities. They can actually be a source of clients. And we really, you know, we sort of broke the back of that um, in, in terms of thinking about the team capacity. And when you ask those questions, Anna, those are great questions because it gets people to think, hmm, maybe the way we are doing it isn't, um, you know, isn't the best way. And frankly, when you move from one organization to another, the same thing happens. You know, you go, I, with me having been at RBC and now, you know, doing many things, including at Deloitte, but it's, oh, well, at RBC, we did things this way. Why are you doing things a different way? Um, and so how do you flip that to, to really thinking about the collective knowledge and making that trade-off that you're going to, of course, there are certain things, there are certain basics we all have to learn. Uh, but if we bring it to the, what are the skills people are bringing? What are the human experiences that people are bringing to the table? And we fill those other gaps in a pretty short period of time, you're getting more value creation. Um, and, um, and so that, you know, that Canadian experience story, which my mother certainly experienced when we moved here, um, it's time to, 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 to really flip out of that and to think of it in a global context. Um, I mean, I can go on and on about this topic. As you can see, I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very passionate about it. Um, and um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually disappointed to see that it's coming up as much um in this conversation because some sectors have actually been able to um to get beyond that um and if i could just indulge with you know one comment i i, I completely agree with doug that we have untapped potential across the whole spectrum um, i think there is research that shows that underrepresented groups um uh, new immigrants people with disabilities 
people of color, indigenous peoples, they have, a, there is a higher um, percentage or, you know, there are more of them and there's more untapped resource there uh, because of the systemic barriers that are faced. And, and so it's really, I think, a matter of, um, you know, the wage gap is close to 30% versus women um, would be in, um, you know, would be in the teens. And so um, that was really the point that I was uh, wanting to get across. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. I think, yeah, there's more work to be done. Although I always uh, remind myself that the perfect is the enemy of the very good. I think in Canada we've, um, and even the very fact that I'm allowed to say we, we in Canada, that's already, I think a big achievement in, in, in Canada that it, it, it is an inclusive society, but there are systemic barriers. And I wanna hope that the pandemic will give an opportunity to overcome these barriers. Um, and if I can say that, yeah, Jean-Christophe, yeah, maybe the, we're, we're going to discuss this at the closing round table. We have, um, I'll, I'll make a little bit of a publicity of the conference. We have two panels tomorrow, three on Wednesday, and our closing round, round table in the morning of Thursday, where we'll try to bring our, you know, our knowledge together and speak about our global migration regimes and our specific national migration regime. And is it fit for purpose given the pandemic challenge? And as we go forward, given also the many changes that we're facing in our economies, changes that are long-term and were happening and some of which have been really um, you know, pushed fast forward um, because of the pandemic. I think this discussion was very, for me, very interesting, very challenging and very important also because of the positive vibe. Thank you all for making the time. Our, panelists that I know are very busy, but thanks to all the audience that have stayed with us for one and a half hour. And I hope to see you tomorrow at, the, at our first panel.